One minute, Mount Etna's rocky slope stood firm above the Mediterranean. Now, billions of tons of its southeast flank are plunging into the sea, unleashing waves that race for Sicily's coast. Scientists tracking the collapse are stunned. Never before has this volcano fractured so violently and so fast. The official story speaks of steady creep, but real-time data reveals a disaster rewriting the limits of geological risk. What chain reaction has been set in motion beneath the surface? Deep beneath Mount Etna's surface, a web of sensors has been recording the mountain's every move. In the weeks before the current crisis, INGV seismologists noticed patterns that stood out from the volcano's usual restlessness. High-resolution seismic plots showed tremor amplitudes rising well above seasonal averages. On December 28th, the main station near Valle del Bove registered a sharp spike. Tremor magnitude briefly doubled, holding at this elevated level for nearly four hours. This was not the random noise of minor eruptions or shallow rockfalls. Instead, the signals suggested movement at depths rarely disturbed in Etna's recent history. At the same time, ground deformation monitors, arrays of GPS receivers and tilt meters began to tell their own story. Data from the eastern flank revealed a sudden acceleration in ground movement. What had been a slow, steady slide of about 14 millimeters per year jumped to nearly three centimeters in less than a week. The rate of change was clearest at stations along the Acetreza and Timpe fault systems, where the ground shifted eastward and downward in tandem. These numbers, plotted out over days, drew a line that bent sharply upwards. It was an unmistakable warning curve. Seismologists at the INGV Catania Observatory compared the signals to historic records. The amplitude and duration of the deep tremors matched only a handful of past events, most notably the episode from 2002 to 2003, when Etna's eastern flank slipped by two meters. But this time, the deformation was not localized. It spread across multiple monitoring sites, from the northern Pernicana Fault to the southern boundaries of the volcano. The data hinted at a broad, coordinated movement, rather than the isolated fractures typically seen during routine eruptions. Within the control room, teams worked around the clock, scrutinizing every new blip on the monitors. The pattern was clear, the, volca the volcano's internal stresses were reaching a critical threshold. The signals did not point to a single crack or fissure, but to a deep, system-wide instability. As the hours ticked by, the evidence mounted that this was not just another eruption cycle. The mountain was preparing for something far more complex and far less predictable. On the eastern slopes of Mount Etna, Structural geologists from INGV began mapping the evolving pattern of fractures as soon as the ground acceleration became clear. What they found defied the usual expectations for volcanic instability. Instead of a single rupture tracing its way down slope, the surface had split along a series of parallel and crisscrossing scarps, each tens to hundreds of meters long. The main slip vectors measured by GPS and laser rangefinders, pointed not just outward toward the sea, but also at odd angles, evidence of deep-seated forces pulling apart the entire southeast sector. Aerial surveys and drone footage revealed a jagged mosaic of displacement zones. Some scarps dropped by as much as four meters in a matter of hours, while others showed slow creeping movement. The overall geometry suggested a domino effect, as one fracture widened, the stress transferred to its neighbors, triggering further breaks. Instead of one catastrophic slide, the mountain's flank was breaking apart in overlapping stages, each adding to the mass on the move. By late afternoon, geologists calculated the total volume of displaced rock and ash. The numbers were staggering. Estimates converged on nearly 2 billion tons of material equivalent to a cube more than one kilometer on each side. This mass, once anchored to the mountain, now shifted inexorably toward the coastline. The boundaries of the collapse zone stretched from the upper reaches of the Valle del Bove, down past the Acetreza and Timpe fault systems, 
encompassing an area never before seen in a single event on Etna. Overlaying fracture zone maps with satellite thermal imagery, the team traced the likely path of debris. The scarp lines and slip vectors pointed straight toward the sea, setting the stage for what would happen next beneath the water's surface. For the first time, the failure pattern suggested the mountain's instability was not confined to land. It was a complex, multi-fracture breakdown, and the consequences would soon extend far beyond the shoreline. Pressure sensors anchored along the Ionian seafloor began transmitting abnormal readings just minutes after the first fractures reached the coastline. At the Iamodnet field station, engineers watched as the digital feed spiked. Pressure anomalies shot upward in a matter of seconds, far surpassing anything recorded during routine seismic swells or seasonal currents. The time-stamped logs showed a sudden, sharp increase at 16.42 and 17 seconds, followed by a series of secondary pulses rippling outward along the submarine slope. Real-time data from the offshore transponder network painted a clear picture. The mass of displaced volcanic debris was now surging down the submerged flank, tracing a path mapped by years of bathymetric surveys. The initial pressure jump corresponded to a wave of material hurtling eastward, its velocity calculated at over 110 kilometers per hour. This figure, flagged by the automated alert system, exceeded previous model projections for even the most aggressive collapse scenarios. As the kinetic energy of the slide transferred into the water column, the pressure sensors registered a rolling cascade of values, each one marking the passage of another lobe of debris. The runout distance tracked by sequential sensor activation stretched more than 18 kilometers from the toe of the collapse zone before the readings began to taper off. Engineers cross-referenced these findings with the latest bathymetric differentials, confirming that the submarine slope had been reshaped in real time. The seabed profile, once a gradual incline, now showed abrupt steps and freshly carved channels, evidence of a complex, multi-phase flow. Within the EM Odd Net control room, the urgency was palpable. Field engineers relayed updates to hazard modelers, who began overlaying the sensor data onto coastal risk maps. With velocities surpassing 100 km per hour and debris plumes advancing toward the open sea, the threat to nearby shorelines was no longer theoretical. The direct link between the undersea flow and potential displacement waves was now visible in the numbers, leaving little doubt about the scale of the unfolding hazard. Remote-operated vehicles guided by marine geologists from the Catania Research Consortium descended along the newly reshaped submarine slope. What their cameras revealed had never been documented on this part of Etna before. Instead of the expected smooth sediment layers, the remote-operated vehicles recorded vast hollows and jagged cavities deep within the submerged flank, some stretching over 70 meters across, hidden beneath centuries of volcanic buildup. These voids, mapped in real time by sonar and laser scanners, suggested a complex internal structure far more fractured than surface models predicted. The team paused at a chamber nearly 400 meters below sea level, its walls lined with fresh cracks and angular boulders as if the mountain's interior had been suddenly torn open by the sliding mass above. Hydrophones anchored nearby began picking up sharp acoustic signatures, brief staccato bursts that stood out from the usual hum of underwater currents. Each spike corresponded to a sudden rush of steam released as seawater found its way into the exposed cavities and met hot rock. The frequency of these steam events climbed rapidly, sometimes reaching dozens per hour. In some cases, the pressure was enough to blast columns of bubbles and debris up through the overlying sediment, sending plumes racing toward the surface. These were not the slow, simmering releases seen during past lava sea encounters, but violent, unpredictable outbursts triggered by the collapse itself. Geologists monitoring the data realized that these newly revealed chambers posed a hazard all their own. As the structure of the submarine flank continued to shift, more pathways opened for seawater to penetrate deeper into the volcano's interior. 
Every new connection risked setting off another round of explosive steam events, each with the potential to destabilize the slope further. The interplay between cold water and hot rock, now happening out of sight beneath the waves, added a layer of uncertainty that no surface monitoring could fully capture. The scientists, piecing together live remote operated vehicle footage and hydroacoustic logs, understood that the collapse had not just shifted the landscape, it had unveiled a hidden world of geological hazards. With each hour, the mountain's underwater profile grew more complex, and the risks of secondary explosions or further structural failures became impossible to ignore. Tsunami models, updated minute by minute, projected the first wave would reach the Sicilian coast in under 12 minutes. The Civil Protection Agency's emergency dashboard, normally reserved for wildfire alerts and minor seismic events, now flashed with red warnings for the entire eastern shoreline. In Catania, sirens echoed through narrow streets as municipal officials triggered the highest level evacuation protocol on record. City buses, commandeered for the crisis, rolled through neighborhoods closest to the port, collecting residents who had only moments to gather essentials. Highways leading inland filled with cars, motorcycles, and even bicycles. All heading toward designated shelters set up in schools and sports arenas. At the same time, smaller towns like Riposto and Achi Castello saw their mayors broadcasting live updates via social media, urging calm but insisting on immediate evacuation. Shelter statistics updated in real time. By 5 p.m., over 38,000 people had registered at inland reception centers, with another 12,000 reported en route. In Messina, hospital staff worked alongside volunteers to move bed-ridden patients to higher floors, or when possible, to waiting ambulances. Satellite-linked dashboards displayed wave arrival charts with predicted run-up heights, and some zones near the mouth of the Semedo River faced peak values exceeding seven meters. Emergency managers monitored these projections, making rapid decisions about which coastal districts to clear first. In Malta, authorities issued their own alerts, instructing residents in low-lying areas to move to pre-identified safe zones as the wave's progress was tracked across the Mediterranean. For many, the evacuation was a blur of instructions, sirens, and hurried departures. Yet behind the numbers and dashboards were local officials making split-second choices, balancing the urgency of the threat against the limits of time and resources. Each new update forced a recalibration, as the reality of the approaching wave left little room for hesitation. Convoys of disaster relief vehicles began rolling south from Rome before sunset, their destinations marked by digital maps of at-risk zones across Sicily. The Italian Civil Protection Department coordinated with neighboring countries, dispatching search and rescue teams and mobile medical units to staging areas near Catania and Messina. Within hours, the European Union activated its Emergency Response Coordination Center, pooling resources from France, Germany, and Malta. Helicopters and cargo planes ferried supplies, emergency food, water, and power generators toward collection points where local authorities scrambled to keep pace with the needs of a swelling displaced population. Shipping lanes off Sicily's eastern coast shut down as the Coast Guard ordered all commercial and fishing vessels to anchor or divert. The port of Catania, usually a hub for container traffic and cruise ships, stood silent. Customs officials logged the first revenue losses within hours as canceled sailings rippled through the region's supply chain. By the end of the day, port authorities reported a 70% drop in vessel movements, with more than 30 ships rerouted or stranded at anchor. Ferry operators halted crossings to Malta, stranding hundreds of travelers and cutting off a vital link for goods and medical supplies. Tourism, a pillar of the Sicilian economy, suffered immediate blows. Hotel associations tallied thousands of cancellations in Catania, Taormina, and the Aeolian Islands. Travel agencies fielded calls from international guests seeking refunds or emergency departures, while local guides and operators watched a season's worth of bookings vanish. Early estimates from regional economic analysts 
projected losses in the tens of millions of euros, with ripple effects likely to last for months. Agricultural cooperatives, meanwhile, braced for disruption as transport delays threatened the export of citrus and wine, just as the winter harvest reached its peak. For many, the crisis was measured not just in lost homes or livelihoods, but in the uncertainty that now gripped the region. The Civil Protection Coordinator, overseeing the operation from a temporary command post in Catania, described the response as a race against time, one made harder by the sheer scale of the disruption and the knowledge that no one could say when the emergency would end. Long before satellites and seismic arrays, the story of Etna's instability was written in the deep layers of the Mediterranean seabed. Core samples drilled from the Ionian Basin contain a silent record, thick beds of jumbled rock and volcanic ash buried beneath 8,000 years of sediment. These layers point to a prehistoric event around 8,000 years ago when part of Etna's eastern flank gave way, sending debris racing into the sea and generating tsunami waves that left their mark as far as the Levant coast. For decades, this ancient collapse was seen as a geological outlier, an episode so rare that it seemed disconnected from the restless slopes above Catania today. Yet, as modern researchers pore over both the old cores and the latest real-time data, the line between past and present feels less certain. Teams from the INGV and international partners have mapped the slow, persistent creep of Etna's southeastern flank, using GPS receivers and offshore transponders to track movement as small as a few centimeters each year. Occasionally, these measurements reveal brief accelerations, spurts of motion triggered by magma intrusions or heavy rainfall. Reminders that the mountain's stability is always in flux. The 2002 to 2003 slip, when the eastern flank shifted by up to two meters, remains a vivid example of how quickly the situation can change. Despite decades of study, key questions remain unanswered. Scientists debate whether the next major collapse would come as a single catastrophic slide or unfold in a series of smaller, compounding failures. The geometry and strength of the buried slip surfaces, hidden hundreds of meters below the summit, are still only partially understood, with ongoing drilling projects struggling to capture the full picture. Even the triggers for sudden acceleration, whether deep earthquakes or changes in pore pressure are the subject of active research. What is clear from both the ancient record and the current monitoring is that Etna's instability is not a problem that can be solved, only managed. The uncertainty itself is now part of the hazard, a reminder that beneath the data and models, the mountain holds secrets that no instrument can fully reveal. Mount Etna's slow, relentless movement, measured in centimeters not catastrophes, reminds us that the greatest threats often unfold quietly beneath our feet. As global coastlines face rising risks from natural and human forces, understanding real geohazards is more urgent than ever. The true danger isn't sudden collapse. It is ignoring the science that warns us before the ground gives way. What do you think? Are we listening closely enough?